Hello everyone, I'm Major General, retired Clay Hupmacher, the President and CEO of the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. Welcome to a continuation of our series, Soft Spoken with Quiet Professionals. Today, we have Chief Warrant Officer 5 retired Dave Cooper with us to recount some actions on a particularly harrowing mission on 27 November of 2006. Before I go into Dave's formal bio, I would like to point out, I've actually had the honor of serving with Dave for multiple years in the 160th Special Ops Aviation Regiment, and then later at the Army Special Ops Aviation Command. He's an exceptional officer and leader, and I'm a better man for having served with him. Um, Dave, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you. I want to take a moment just to go through your, uh, through your bio. And then I'm going to hand you the mic and so you can walk us through the events of 27 November 2006, which I know very well, but I know the audience uh, will be very appreciative and interested in hearing uh, what, what happened that particular day. So Dave Cooper Great. listed in the Army in 1985 and attended Army Warrant Officer flight training the following year. Uh, initially, he was an age 64 Apache, Apache pilot uh, with a 6 Cav at Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, Dave flew several combat missions during Operation Desert Storm four years later. He saw the light and volunteered for the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment. After completing Green Platoon and transitioning to the AH-6 light attack helicopter, Dave quickly progressed uh, from fully mission qualified aviator, instructor pilot, operations officer to our highest qualification for an air crew member, flight lead and 1st Battalion 160 SOAR. He has deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq no less than 23 times in support of the global war on terror. He was awarded the Silver Star in two, earlier in 2006 for a particularly dangerous mission which claimed the lives of two of his teammates. Dave Cooper was the first Night Stalker in our history to receive the Distinguished Service Cross for extraordinary heroism as a flight lead during Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2007. He received the medal in 2007, he earned it in 2006. Dave Cooper was selected after that as the 160th Command Chief Warrant Officer. And following on, uh, we served together again when he was the Command Chief Warrant Officer at the Army Special Ops Aviation Command from 2011 until he retired in 2012. Dave joins us from Clarksville, Tennessee, uh, not probably an almost stone's throwing distance back to our alma mater on Fort Campbell. Dave, uh, thank you so much for being here with us and welcome to the podcast. Sir, thanks for having me here. I first wanna uh, thank you and uh, thank your organization for having me today. And I, I wanna tell the audience that it's truly been my pleasure to serve with, for and alongside uh, Major General Clay Hupmacher. He's a uh, outstanding combat leader and uh, a great human being. He's uh, he's well loved back at the regiment. Both him and his family well loved. So, uh, thanks for having me today. Well, thank you very much, and the check is forthcoming for that shout out to you. Uh, so, thanks very much. So, Dave, you know, I want to pass you the mic and talk to you, or have you talk us through what happened on 20 November 2006. I was the battalion commander at the time, though I was not deployed forward with you. I was monitoring the battle very closely back at Fort Campbell. And uh, I think the way you described it uh, to marry your wife afterwards was that was a particularly uh, hard day at the office, uh, the master of the understatement to say the least, uh, but because it was much more than that. And I'll also tell you that um, the highest, to the audience, the highest praise from us is when the ground forces we support uh, acknowledge what we've done or give us a shout out. I spoke with the ground force commander that particular day many times following that mission and his personal opinion he expressed to me every single time was that you should have received the Medal of Honor for your actions that day. And uh, I happen to be of the same opinion. So Dave, with that, I'm gonna pass you the mic and uh, please walk us through that tough day at the office. Thank you, Clay. Uh, I wanna start off by uh, uh, reminding everyone that Army and combat is a team event. And I was one person on the team 
I happened to be there that day. And I, I promise you, anybody in the Army, certainly any one of the Night Stalkers, would have done the same things I did and that we're going to talk about today, but probably would have done it better. Uh, but as that, that being as it may, I, I do want to uh, walk you through uh, some of the events. Uh, first of all, it's hard to believe uh, that it's been uh, 14 years already. I don't know. Uh, it's just, just amazing. At any rate, uh, I want to uh, let you know that the AH-6 is that same helicopter that you used to see in the Magnum PI, right? That, that colored helicopter is very small. Two uh, adult men can barely fit in the darn thing. And frankly, it, uh, it only carries three things. It carries a crew, it carries fuel, and it carries guns. And it's called up uh, by the ground force uh, to support their movements, to support their activities on the ground. If they get in trouble, they might call the AH-6 to uh, lay down some suppressing fire. If they see a target that they can't reach with their weapons, they'll call in the AH-6 to uh, strike that target. So this particular day in November, uh, actually it was a beautiful day, there wasn't a cloud in the sky, and uh, we got a mission to uh, go uh, about uh, 50 miles or so away to uh, take care of a particular terrace that we had been tracking. Uh, so that day, we had two Blackhawks filled with the assault force, right, the soldiers on the ground. Uh, we had two MH6s. Now, these are the very small helicopters where uh, soldiers ride on the outside of the helicopter, and that, that one lands directly on the target uh, to insert the soldiers right to the target. And we had two AH6s, the one I just described, uh, and uh, to provide fire support. So that on that particular day, <clears throat> excuse me, I was the flight lead of that mission. So we're on the way to uh, interdict the uh, target, and lo and behold, I heard something on the radio that I had not heard before on the radio. Frankly, it's hard to get a night stalker to speak on the radio, number one. We never talk. Uh, but uh, the microphone was keyed, and I heard someone say, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. And frankly, I'd never heard that. I'd seen a couple of B-17 movies in World War II uh, where people had said Mayday, but I had never heard it in person. I looked over and I had recognized my uh, wingman's voice. I looked over and looked at his helicopter and realized immediately what he was talking about. His, uh, his tail rotor was off, uh, off his helicopter. For, uh, for anyone that knows anything about helicopter uh, aerodynamics, that tail rotor is fairly important. Uh, so without a tail rotor, uh, there's not much control. So uh, the wingman uh, <clears throat> being the outstanding uh, Army aviator that he is, uh, he still serves actually, uh, he did a controlled crash landing onto the desert floor. Uh, where we were in the desert, it was completely flat, flat like a, a, a billiard table flat. And he was able to land the helicopter at about 80 miles an hour uh, over the desert on skids. Uh, we don't have uh, wheels on skids and, uh, you know, came to a controlled crash there. Well, the Blackhawks landed and disgorged the uh, troops. They got out and formed a perimeter. And the MH6s, they landed, their troops hopped off their planks and uh, joined the perimeter. And then uh, I flew around a couple of times in a couple of circles, making sure that we were safe and landed uh, to make sure that that crew got out. Uh, they were beat up for sure. Uh, no broken bones, uh, no internal injuries, thank God, but uh, they looked as if they had just been in a catastrophic helicopter crash, frankly. Uh, we got them uh, over to the Blackhawks and they took off with uh, my crew members there on the way to the hospital. It was about at this time when a ground force uh, sergeant uh, approached me and said, uh, you know, we're all very informal, said, hey, Dave, I, I wonder if you could crank your helicopter, get back up in the air and look at these gun trucks that just pulled up. And I looked over and I saw five trucks just pulling up pickup trucks, small pickup trucks, if you will, with huge guns in the back. And at first it was a time in the world we thought, well, it might be the Iraqi National Guard or it might be um, the Iraqi police. We didn't know. And about the time I got to my helicopter, they started shooting at us. So it was fairly apparent that this wasn't any of the above, right? Uh, this was the Al Qaeda had come to, uh, they saw us land and come to, uh, come to the fight. So uh, crank the helicopter up and took off immediately. Now the crews that were in the MH6s 
uh, they couldn't, there was so much fire, they couldn't get to their helicopters and take off. So they grabbed their long guns, their rifles, and joined the, uh, joined the men on the perimeter and began firing back. So uh, helicopter operations for the attack usually include at least two helicopters, where one helicopter is in the bump and shooting at the target and then breaks off. And then his wingmen then start shooting at the same targets, thus covering the lead, the wing, uh, the uh, flight leader's break, right? Uh, but we didn't have that, I only had myself. So got up and started, uh, so the fight was on. I didn't want to get too far in front of uh, friendly forces because uh, I, I know these guys, we have been comrades for years and years, and if I had been shot down out there, there was no doubt in my mind they were going to come and get me, and that was not going to not going to uh, work. The other thing that dawned uh, me and the co-pilot immediately was that the gun trucks were shooting at us. They were not shooting at the ground force, which is exactly what you want to have happen. We're there to protect the ground force, and if they're shooting at us, well, that's fine. They're not shooting at the guys on the ground. And the next thing I want to say to make sure everyone on this broadcast knows that the bravest human is a co-pilot because their hands aren't on the controls. They're going where the pilot takes them. Their entire job is to arm, go to arm and go back to safe on the weapon system and to point out targets. That's all they can do. So wherever I was flying, whatever I was doing, the co-pilot was frankly along for the ride. And he is, as I said, one of the most courageous people I know. So anyway, uh, we got into the fight. Uh, the gun trucks are shooting at us. I'm shooting back. I do want to talk just a minute about the volume of fire that we were receiving. Uh, if anybody in the audience has ever been shot at, you would likely know that when the bullet goes past you, uh, it makes a loud crack as it's passing the uh, sound barrier, right? Well, in a helicopter, we have helmets on. We have all kinds of devices to keep the outside noise quiet so we can hear each other speaking. But when we keyed the microphone, it sounded like we were inside a bag of popcorn inside the microwave. It was so noisy from the amount of bullets going past us. It was just crazy. Well, we, uh, we're shooting back and it dawns on us fairly quickly that we are going to run out of ammunition. And there's just no way that we are going to leave the ground force uh, naked without any air support. Uh, the ground force is shooting their weapons, all they're worth, but the targets are just at the edge of their weapons uh, range. And so we could fly back to base, been a half hour back there, fly in a half hour, land, rearm and refuel, that would have been 10 minutes, and then fly the half hour back. So I would have been gone for an hour and 10 minutes. And there was just no way that my co-pilot and I were going to let that happen. And so what we did was land at the crashed helicopter. We landed there, put the engine to idle, let the blades continue to turn. We unbuckled our seatbelts, jumped out, and began taking ammunition out of the crashed helicopter and putting it into our helicopter. So for anybody that uh, is uh, reading their helicopter gunnery manual right now, I know that you know that it says you cannot use ammunition if it's been dropped more than three feet because it might not fire or it might fire inadvertently. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about being in a catastrophic helicopter crash. So my oh, no. co-pilot and I jumped out and got that as much of that ammunition as we could off the crash helicopter and put it into ours. And then we strapped back in and uh, went back into the fight. We did that for a total of four separate times. On the third time we landed, we needed fuel. And we were very lucky that those pilots from the MH6s were still there. They saw what, what we were doing and they became our forward area refueling guys. Right, so they were pulling ammo out of the crashed helicopter and setting it aside so that when I landed, they could just hop up and put that ammunition into my helicopter. Well, they also uh, were able to use a Leatherman to open up a uh, auxiliary fuel tank and get fuel out of that fuel tank and get that fuel into me. So now I had fuel and ammunition. Uh, so we were able to stay in the fight uh, indefinitely now. Uh, about this time, we got the uh, Air Force involved. And we had a combat controller on the ground uh, as one of the assault force. 
and the combat controller was able to call in some F-16s and get them there, but he is having a hard time getting the F-16's eyes onto the target because it was so flat. We didn't have anything to tell him to, you know, you, you know, from this intersection, go this many miles look in this direction. We didn't have any of those, uh, those things to point out to him. So finally, the F-16s saw the target that uh, is uh, interdicting, is shooting at us and we're shooting back. So the, uh, the pilot of the F-16, of course, it's a single seat fighter. He saw the target and rolls in. He's got his guns on and he's shooting on his first pass and barely nicks one of the targets. He comes around again and uh, we're cheering him on. You know, here he is, comes around again. And this time he's shooting at the target and begins to put rounds on the target. Unfortunately, uh, he got what's called target fixation. And he kept his eyes on the target, forgetting about where his airplane was in relationship to the earth and looked up at the last second and saw he was too close and he pulled back on his jet, but he was too close to the earth and smacked the ground. Uh, he was killed instantly, unfortunately. Uh, this, uh, this brave airman was Major Troy Lee Gilbert uh, and Troy left, uh, left a family, right? So he left a wife and, uh, five children, but, uh, the crash, uh, really, uh, and getting rounds on the target is what, uh, drove the, uh, Al Qaeda off that day. And what was left of their force, uh, uh, packed up and left and left our force there. Uh, we were able to get, uh, a little bit later, we were able to get the Blackhawks back in, pick up the ground force, and uh, leave the area. I do want to say a couple things here. First, about the uh, two pilots that were in the helicopter crash. They went back, right, and uh, going to the hospital. The hospital was alerted. The helicopter that was taken aback landed on the hospital pad. But instead of going into the hospital, the two crew members got out, walked past the gurneys, walked past the nurses, walked past the doctors, and trotted over the very first helicopter they could find that was loaded, got in it, cranked it up, and came back to the fight. That's the kind of men, that's the kind of soldiers, let me say it like that, that's the kind of soldiers that are in your special operations forces today and are in your army and in all your armed forces today. That kind of determination and dedication to each other. The second thing I want to bring up is uh, Troy Lee Gilbert. Like I said, Troy uh, left a wife and family behind, five children. Special Ops Warrior Foundation is lucky enough to be able to support those children. And two of them right now are in college. One's at Clemson and the other is in medical school. So again, I, I just happened to be the guy there that day. But if, if this story moves you like it does me. The dedication of Troy Gilbert to get that F-16 there when his wingman wasn't there, to get rounds on the target to save his buddies that were in need. If that story moves you like it does me, I urge you to consider, strongly consider, supporting the Special Ops Warrior Foundation and all the things that they do. They're supporting the families back here at the house. I appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me, Clay. No, a, a, a thanks, uh, Dave, uh, and, and very well said, and, uh, and you were right. I mean, we were, when you say we're lucky to be able to support them, it is. It is a privilege, and, you know, uh, we support yep. a lot of different families out there that uh, a member of their family has made the ultimate sacrifice in the service to the nation, and it is, a, uh, it is truly a privilege to do that. Um, I'll tell you, uh, Troy is, uh, I didn't mention that Troy's uh, buried at Arlington National Cemetery in Section 60, uh, Grave 8520. So if anybody's in the Arlington area and you want to visit the cemetery, stop by and say hello to Troy. You know, interesting you brought that up, but you and I were both at his final interment. I know there were several, but when he was finally brought out, it you know, to me, it was... Um, appropriate that special ops were the ones that went in and re that recovered him ultimately and brought him out and that it was a 160th helicopter that flew him 
uh, back to the airfield where he was ultimately, um, you know, brought back to the United States and interned in Arlington, uh, as you stated. Um, a couple of questions for you as, uh, before we wrap up. So, you know, a key, and it, it, for all the aviators out there, especially the special ops folks, night versus day you know we uh, we call ourselves the night stalkers for a reason we prefer to operate at night um can you talk a little bit about the different dynamics on the target when we're operating during the day i mean obviously the advantage is with a little bird at night you can't see them uh, but during the day can't help but see them i guess uh how did that uh you know how did that alter the equation for you at that time in the war, right, well, you're exactly right, but at that time in the war, we wanted to keep maximum pressure on the Al-Qaeda and uh, the bad actors there in Iraq. And so we were operating 24-7 uh, with the regular army and with special operations, trying to bring maximum pressure onto their, uh, onto their formations. Uh, this happened to be a day, uh, a day event. Now, we did have uh, other crews that were at night uh, but of course, during this event, they were uh, they were fast asleep because they had flown the night prior. Uh, but yeah, I, at night you have all the advantages. It's hard for them to see us. We can see them perfectly. It's uh, it's not nearly as uh, exciting uh, during the day. It can make for a hard day at the office. No, you're absolutely right. Exciting is a uh, the master of the understatement there. Um, well, Dave, uh, thanks very much for taking the time to uh, spend with us and to uh, join us on this series. You know, um, I, I I'm honored and proud to have been able to serve with you and to call you a friend, and, uh, and I'm a better man for having served with you. And, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I, and I, and I think you personify, you know, our logo, our, our motto in the 160th is Night Stalkers Don't Quit. And you certainly didn't quit that day. And like I had said at the beginning of this, uh, our session here, the ground force commander felt absolutely the same way. And he went out of his way to, to tell me and anyone else that was listening, uh, that would listen to him that you were the key. You were the, you were standing in the breach between them and, and a potentially very hazardous situation, uh, with the enemy. So thanks very much. Uh, for joining Again, us. Again, thank, uh, thank you, and uh, thanks Special Operations Warrior Foundation uh, for having me here today. I appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Well, thanks, Dave, and please pass my best to Mary and your ladies, your girls there back in Clarksville, Tennessee, and I hope we get Love a your family. Up soon. All right. Thank you, sir. Night stalkers don't quit. <laughs>